You're listening to the new season of Breakdown, an exclusive podcast from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. This season, the McIver murder case. For additional information, photos, videos, and previous seasons of Breakdown, go to ajcbreakdown.com and follow our Twitter feeds at AJC Breakdown and at AJC Courts. Inside the Big Ford Expedition, the gunshot sounds like the end of the world. Three people ride in the SUV, a power couple with their good friend at the wheel. It's 10 o'clock on a late September Sunday, a sultry fall day in Atlanta. The women are sitting in the front, talking as old friends will, easily, at length. In the back, Claude Tex McIver, a politically connected labor lawyer. In the front passenger seat, his wife Diane, the hard-charging CEO of an outdoor advertising company. Tex is the archetypal Southern gentleman, soft-spoken, courtly, white-haired, the kind who always stands up when a woman walks into the room, never misses a chance to open a door for what he would call a lady. But as you'll see, he's a bit more complicated than that. Like at this moment, there's a gun in Tex's lap, a snub-nosed 38 revolver, the weapon that's about to kill his wife. Near the southern foot of Atlanta's Piedmont Park, the bullet that erupts from the 38 passes through the car's front seat. On a slight upward path, it strikes Diane McIver in the back. The bullet travels through Diane, piercing organ after organ, a kidney and the pancreas, and the major artery leading to the spleen. Diane had just handed the gun to her husband, and then he shot her with it. A spokesman for Tex later said McIver had been unnerved by the possibility that Black Lives Matter demonstrators were near the car. That's an incredibly important point. Why Tex felt the need to handle the weapon in the first place. This is a mystery about a killing. We know who the killer is. The mystery is this. What the hell is going through Tex McIver's head at that moment? Had he just been jolted awake and accidentally pulled the trigger? That's what Tex says. Or was he seizing an unexpected opportunity to kill his wife and make it look like an accident? The district attorney thinks it was intentional, a malice murder, and he's putting Tex on trial for it in two weeks. I'm Bill Rankin, legal affairs reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and joining me in the booth for this fifth season of Breakdown is my friend Craig Schneider, one of the AJC's top reporters. He's covered every step of the McIver case. Thanks, Bill. I'm thrilled to be here on Breakdown. This story is, first, a tragedy. It's about a popular and accomplished woman with a generous heart and an incredibly infectious laugh. When you were speaking with Diane McIver, her friends say she acted as if you were the only person in the world. But if you get her dander up, she could be tough as nails. It's also a uniquely Atlanta story about wealth, a lot of wealth, and love, and race, and politics, and of course, traffic. And don't forget about guns. We tend to have more iron than sense in this town. Craig? I had exclusive, on-the-record interviews with Tex MacGyver twice. Interviews as lawyers regret today, I'm sure, don't you think? We like interviews that lawyers wind up regretting. Most attorneys won't let their clients talk to reporters when the client is facing a potential murder charge. Here's what Tex told me during the first interview. It was a tragic accident. Um, experienced devastation that I'm going to have the rest of my life. You know, not only have you lost your, your life partner, but you're the reason. Now, this is not a guy who had a little timeshare on the Florida panhandle. He has a luxury buckhead condo and an 85-acre ranch east of Atlanta with longhorn steers and... Whoa, Craig, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's get to the heart of the story the drive in the Ford Expedition, and the last day of Diane McIver's life. Well, we can give you the accounts of two people in the SUV who weren't killed. This is how that day, September 25th, 2016, started. I mean, he had gotten up really early and brought us both coffee upstairs and, mm-hmm. you know, made breakfast. That's Danny Joe Carter, a friend of Diane's for 40 years and the person who was behind the wheel that night. She's telling the story of that day to an Atlanta police detective hours after the fatal shooting. Danny Joe, who was 61 at the time, had a hair salon and regularly did Diane's hair and makeup. 
Among other things, she did eyebrow microblading and permanent eye makeup. She was such a good friend of the family that Tex had given her a horse, which was stabled at the MacGyver's Pea Ridge Ranch. That sunny September day, Tex and Diane MacGyver met a friend for a round of golf at the Reynolds Plantation Course, not far from their ranch. It was a beautiful day, you know, to play golf. Oh, yeah. I had it sure great, was. I had a great day riding horses. Here's Tex's recollection of the day. Any day with Diane was hard. We played golf earlier in the day. This is really significant. She shot a 76. Uh, I shot a, a 94. Pretty good for me. But she's an amazing golfer. We came, went from the golf course to the ranch, showered, got a car, Danny Joe driving. When you drive out to Putnam County, 75 miles east of Atlanta, you're unquestionably in the sticks. It's totally rural Georgia. Farmland, forest. I saw signs for pecans. Hold on. All right, wait a minute. You need to know that Craig's from Long Island. A pecan sounds like something you might use in New York. We're talking, of course, about pecans. Right, pecans. Then you come up upon the Reynolds Plantation, an enclave of vacation and retirement homes with a Ritz-Carlton Lodge, a giant lake, and a championship golf course. Pea Ridge Ranch. Most of us in Georgia would call it a farm, but MacGyver was from Texas, where they have ranches. It lies near the Reynolds development. It's quite a spread. I went out there to poke around. The front lawn is really a pasture and a pond with a small herd of longhorns grazing. The ranch house sprawls with steeply pitched gables and a wraparound porch. Behind it stands the guest house, which contains both a stable and a recreation of an old western saloon. Remember that guest house? The state is apparently using it as part of the motive for murder. So let's get on with it. After the round of golf, Tex, Diane, and Danny Joe embark on the drive to where the MacGyvers also have a 3,400-square-foot condominium in the wealthy Buckhead district of Atlanta. They stop at the town of Conyers, about 25 miles outside of Atlanta. They meet a co-worker of Diane's for dinner, at, of course, the Longhorn Steakhouse. But Tex, inexplicably, has fish. The receipt shows that they ordered a bottle of Trinity Oaks Pinot. From here on in, we're going to hear a great deal from Danny Joe in her police interview and Tex in his interview with Craig. I had a bottle of wine and I think Diane drank two glasses and okay. Tex had one. Diane ordered a bottle of wine. I think it was white. How much did you drink? A sip. What is a sip? Well, I put it in my mouth and I didn't like it. She didn't finish the bottle. Maybe a couple of glasses. Up to this point, this has been a strikingly mundane day. But if you buy into the state's theory of the case, Tex may have already been thinking of killing his wife, right? If you accept the state's theory. So it seemed like a good day. Nothing out of the ordinary. Until, because of Atlanta traffic, everything changes. After drinking the wine, Diane had Danny Joe drive the rest of the way to Atlanta. There was construction on the city's infamous downtown connector, turning Sunday evening traffic into a rush hour nightmare. Right when we got on 85, it was just a parking lot. And Tex was asleep, and Diane was fussing at him because she said, you know, if he didn't wake up, he wasn't going to go to sleep tonight. Right. He wouldn't be asleep. Okay. So she was, she was fussing at him. Mm-hmm. Frustrated by the traffic on the connector, they did what most of us do. They got the hell off the connector. They exited onto Edgewood Avenue. They go down a ramp and turn left, passing under the connector. It's dark. It's a long enough underpass that it feels like a tunnel. It's a place where homeless people are known to congregate. He's like, I think this is a bad idea, girls. This is a bad area. He said, darling, he said, why don't you just hand me my gun? And he said it, it was in the console. And it was in a bag, even though he's got a permit. So she took it out because I was driving and handed it to him. Yes, Diane just handed Tex the very gun that would kill her. And this is crucial, Bill. Why did Tex ask for the gun? Well, in the days after Diane's death, a spokesman for Tex, yes, Tex had a spokesman, took the story into a whole different realm. Here's spokesman Bill Crane. 
what I said to you, what he said to me was when they come on into that dark area and there were people on both sides of the street that he thought were coming at the car, he did not know were these Black Lives Matters protesters, were these homeless people, were these carjackers. Stop right there. So it sounds as if Tex was equating Black Lives Matter protesters with homeless people and carjackers. This is what's known as the black boogeyman tactic, right? Something bad happens, blame it on a black man. This would come back to haunt MacGyver again and again. Here's Crane again. Mm -hmm. In any event, two women in the front of the car, a big white kind of standout SUV in the middle of the night, him in the back seat, he felt threatened. So he asked his wife, honey, hand me the gun. Tex denies ever saying the words Black Lives Matter. And in fact, Many people who follow the case have expressed amazement that Texas PR guy would introduce race into the conversation to begin with. One of them is Esther Panich, an Atlanta criminal defense attorney. She's not connected to the McIver case, but she's closely following it. Race didn't play any role in this until the statement about Black Lives Matter came out. And then it became a case about race, or at least involving race which is not something the defense ever wants to inject into a case. Now he looks as one of those white people who just want to point the finger at another, a minority, and blame them for the situation he himself caused. Remember, Tex told us he never did that, even though his spokesman says he did. That's right, he did. But let's get back to the drive, okay? Okay. So they get past this so-called Black Lives Matter incident, and in just a few blocks, Danny Joe would turn onto Piedmont Avenue, which runs from downtown Atlanta out to Buckhead. It's also the street on which Diane MacGyver would suffer a fatal gunshot. So we're just driving down Piedmont, and he was quiet. I'm sure he went to sleep with a gun in his hand. And Diane and I were just talking. Yeah. He fell asleep with the gun in his hand, like you do. Seriously, this is a big, big problem, right? How in the world do you explain that away? You're sitting in the back seat. You're holding a loaded gun. The gun is pointing at the woman you love. You fall asleep. Oh, one more thing. Tex McIver served on the American Bar Association's Standing Committee on Gun Violence. So, the SUV is driving north on Piedmont. We stopped in the red light. And Diane and I were just chattering away. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, we hear the boom, which, I mean, I shoot guns all the time. I don't know why. It, well, I just didn't imagine why there would be... You didn't expect it? No. I wouldn't. Uh-uh. And, I mean, I kind of thought somebody might have hit us or something, right. you know, and I'm looking around, and I see Tex... Um, putting the gun down, and and he said um, something about, you know, falling asleep, and I don't know what image was in his mind when he woke up. I was suddenly awakened. I lurched, and the gun fired, and I was just just absolutely shocked. I probably forgot I had it in my lap, but I, I, I was startled. Boom. There's the sound of the gun, there was a flash, and uh, I immediately started asking if anybody was hurt. I was startled, there was a noise, there was a flash, and then I'm holding her my arm, reaching around the seat, holding her, asking Danny Jones to speed through the streets to get us to the hospital. I wanted to understand what that gunshot must have been like inside the car. So I went to Sharpshooters USA in Roswell to fire a 38 caliber snub nose. I'm not a gun person, but the store was kind enough to lend me a similar type of gun. They didn't have the Smith & Wesson model that Tex used. Then they took me out to the gun range. Now, I want to warn y'all, the shot you're about to hear is coming from your car's speaker or out of your earbuds. It's just a recording. Go ahead and try one more. I'm not accustomed to shooting a gun, but that is jarring. Jarring indeed. And yes, it must have sounded like the end of the world. And Diane did not know that she was hit and didn't act like that she was hit. And I'm thinking that there's a bullet hole in the 
floor of the car. Right. Because she was just, you know, giving him a hard time for doing something that stupid. And then she started just, you know, kind of moving around. And she said that she was shot. And I thought she was joking. And right. I thought, well, I guess it's possible. I realized that I needed to, if that was really real, we've got to get out of here to the hospital. And she was talking and acting fun. And then she started breathing funny. And and she, you know, kind of passed out. And Tex was talking to her. He was in the back seat and he was holding her head. And he says, darling, darling, just, you know, talk to me. And he was just trying to keep her. And we knew that she was breathing. We don't know exactly where this happened. The video cameras on Piedmont were either not working or pointed in the wrong direction. We think the car was close to one of the main entrances to Piedmont Park. Piedmont Park is the green space of Atlanta. It's one of the legacies of architect Frederick Law Olmsted. He also designed Central Park in New York. What happened next may be a key part of the case. Tex tells Danny Joe to drive Diane to Emory Hospital. They did not call 911. Emory is one of Atlanta's premier hospitals, but it may not have been the best place to go under the circumstances. An Emory University policeman later told detectives that only two people had previously arrived at Emory Hospital after suffering gunshot wounds in the past five years. One was a shooting on campus. The other, just a mile away. Also, Emory wasn't the closest emergency room. We okay. pulled up to the curb at the ER. Uh, I yelled out, got a shot. Uh, we've all had experience with the ERs and broken arms and everything else, but I wanted the right people. And I respond. There were folks there who, who melted back and other folks came. They were all in a real super dark blue. I pulled into the emergency room and he, I said, do you want me to get out? He, he got out and went and got somebody um, and they came out with a wheelchair and he was trying to get her out of the car. And I mean, Texas, 73 years old. He's 5'10". Diane's 5'9". She's, she only weighs about 135 pounds, but I didn't want him to hurt her or right. hurt him. So, right. And so the other people came and um, helped get her in, into okay. the wheelchair. I took her out of the car seat. They rolled up a gurney a bed. Uh, a couple of guys helped me, but we laid her on the gurney. <laughs> Everybody's just like on TV, everybody's going fast and hurrying. We go into this room, I've got her arm, her hand, and then going to touch her for him. Dr. Suzanne Hardy took charge of saving Diane McIver's life. Hardy also teaches emergency medicine at Emory. Yeah, we get her account from a transcript of her interview with Atlanta police detective Darren Smith. Dr. Hardy tells Smith that Diane was wheeled into our emergency room too. As Dr. Hardy tries to take Diane's blood pressure, she notes the through-and-through through bullet wounds. Then, Diane says something that seems critically important. It was an accident, Diane told Dr. Hardy. And Diane said that without any prompting, Dr. Hardy told the detective. Hardy didn't just say this to Detective Smith one time. She said it three times. At one point, Dr. Hardy went outside to see Tex McIver. And she tells me twice that Diane said it was an accident. She bragged on the team that was upstairs in the OR and said, we're going to roll her up to the OR. So I, I thanked her. Somebody took me up to the third floor. We rode on the elevator. Dr. Hardy said she was afraid Diane would die. When she was intubated, that's when they stick a breathing tube down your throat. Diane was also afraid. She told the doctor, quote, unquote, I'm going to die. At that point, Dr. Hardy asked whether Diane wants to see her husband. Diane says no. And then we waited. We waited. Came the darkest moment of my life. Around the corner came the two surgeons and a black lady that was said she was the chaplain. But I instinctively looked behind me thinking, God, let this be somebody else. Nobody's behind me. They're coming straight for me, especially with the chaplain. And they asked if I'd step into an ante room. We did. The surgeon spoke. They said we did everything we could. The bullet was struck the heart. And we did our best. Then they left. And the lady stayed. And then I was completely in shock. 
MacGyver calls his friend and lawyer Steve Maples to the hospital. In an interview with the AJC afterward, Maples said the medical team allowed Tex and his lawyer to go in and see Diane's body. Maples described what Tex said and did. I love you, I love you, I love you. He kissed her. He smoothed her hair back. He caressed her face. He said, I love you, I love you. He was crying. MacGyver and Maples have a history. It just so happens that Maples represented MacGyver in a 1990 shooting incident. Tex had confronted some teenagers who were sitting in a car in his cul-de-sac drinking beer. According to the police report, MacGyver sicked his dogs on the kids and later fired three shots into the car as it was moving. He was one of the teens testifying way back when about where the bullets hit the car. There's a, um, it's, it's like a, a plastic, it's a real kind of a, the, the skirt is. And it didn't shatter it, but it punched a hole in it. I felt the report of that gun. And I know what the report off of the gun feels like. It's a shockwave. You just you feel it. And I felt it. I felt like someone was slamming something on my door. Tex, for his part, claimed the car was charging at him. But Tex was charged with three counts of aggravated assault. Those are serious felony offenses. Prosecutors ultimately dropped the charges after Tex agreed to pay for the damage to the teen's car, Maple said. So Tex had called an old friend to be with him at the hospital. That old friend also happened to be the lawyer who got him off in a prior shooting incident. Kind of makes you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? And that's the story of Diane MacGyver's death. It was a strange, horrible, sometimes bizarre episode. But what came after is maybe stranger still. Inconsistent accounts, incriminating statements, questionable, if not irrational, behavior. Accusations that Tex was trying to cover up the events of that night. And let's clear one thing up. From the very beginning, people have wondered why Tex told Danny Joe to go to Emory Hospital. There were three other hospitals at least as close, including a level one trauma center. Some people have suggested that Tex deliberately went to a hospital farther away so that his wife would bleed out on the way. Danny Joe estimated it took her seven minutes to get to Emory, running red lights with her emergency flashers on all the way. I drove the same route on a Sunday night. It took me nine minutes, 20 seconds, but I drove the normal speed limit and I waited two minutes for traffic lights. If I'd run those lights, and I could have, it would have taken me about the same amount of time Danny Joe said it took her to get there. So, by our calculations, Emory Hospital was about 4.4 miles from the scene of the shooting. And I could have driven there in about seven minutes if I'd not stopped for traffic lights and disobeyed the speed limit. I'm sure prosecutors are gonna tell the jury there were three other hospitals not nearly as far away from the scene. So, Craig and I both made the drives to those hospitals and timed them. Emory Midtown Hospital, once known as Crawford Long Hospital, is only one and a half miles away. It would have taken us just under four minutes to drive there if we didn't stop for the red lights. Piedmont Hospital, where I went when I was a kid, is about two and a half miles away. But there are also about a dozen traffic lights you have to deal with. We made that drive in nine minutes, 15 seconds. But we got stopped by about 10 lights, delaying our drive by about four minutes. So, if we had run all those lights, it would have taken about five minutes and 15 seconds. Grady Memorial Hospital is about three miles away. We hadn't had to wait for stoplights. It would have taken us six minutes, 20 seconds to get there. So Emory Midtown was by far the best option, time-wise. We don't know if it would have made a difference whether Diane would have lived or died if Tex had directed Danny Joe to go to one of the closer hospitals or if they had called 911. I bet we'll hear testimony about this at the trial. What we do know is that Grady Hospital is one of the top trauma centers in the country. ER doctors there routinely treat gunshot wounds. Bob Pabian, a former business associate who had known Diane for 39 years, said he could never understand why Tex chose any other hospital but Grady. Anybody that has lived in Atlanta for a week should know about Grady. The trauma center, probably the best equipped. And if I had to go somewhere, I would want to go to Grady in any uh, emergency situation like that. So that raised a red flag in my mind. 
In the days after the shooting, the conduct of Tex and Maples, his lawyer, was highly unusual. A man had just shot and killed his wife, and he didn't sit for an interview with Atlanta police until two days later. That upset people. Now, you have to remember this was a highly publicized incident. I'm not sure you and I could get away with that, but Tex did. And the day before the interview, Maples told Atlanta police that Tex would come in, but he would not discuss the shooting. Seriously? Do you get to do that after you've killed your wife? Wouldn't you have a certain amount of explaining to do, like right now? This led some people to conclude that Tex, being a rich white lawyer with political connections, was calling the shots on his own homicide investigation. Next was Bill Crane's early invocation of Black Lives Matter. As you can imagine, this gave the story legs it might have otherwise lacked. Black activists around the nation were jumping on this tone-deaf narrative. By now, McIver was denying that he had ever said anything about Black Lives Matter. So, we reached out to Bill Crane. He stood by his earlier statement. I understand, particularly in the black community, the sensitivity to it. But in Atlanta, the majority of protesters who actually were arrested in Black Lives Matter protests weren't black. I don't believe now, I didn't believe then, that Texas statements were casting a racial aspersion. I got a phone call first from Steve Maples, Texas attorneys, later from Tex himself. And the request was, I need you to fall on your sword. I need you to retract, take back the Black Lives Matter reference. And that was the initial ask. Then the ask later became, I didn't say it. I wasn't in the car, that I didn't suffer the trauma he did. But I have very crystalline memories of those conversations. It was a very traumatic time for him. I felt badly for him. And I still feel that if it was just, if you just felt it was some homeless people hanging around in Midtown, that didn't quite cause the fear that I heard in his voice as he was telling me why he asked for the gun. Now we come to one of the most bizarre moments in this entire affair. Just weeks after Diane's death, Tex held an auction of his wife's extraordinary wardrobe and possessions and jewelry. Not one auction, not two, three auctions. Diane MacGyver's wardrobe and everything else required three auctions. I went to one of them. The collection looked like a Nordstrom department store, if not better. Dozens of hats and a Melda Marcos-worthy collection of shoes and boots. An 18-carat gold Rolex with 100 diamonds, valued at about 10 grand. Gold and diamond tennis bracelet, valued up to 5 grand. Handbag after handbag sold for 1,000 bucks each. Furs sold up to $2,000 each. Diamond-studded earrings, $17,000. Large diamond necklace, $28,000. The Fulton DA's office went to court to try to stop the auctions. Texas' explanation to the court? He needed the cash because his wife had left large sums of money in her will to friends and employees. So he had to sell off her stuff to raise the money. A judge allowed the auctions to go forward, but any way you cut it, this looked bad. Not just bad, Craig. Horrendous. And you have to remember this. A lot of people watching this play out live in Fulton County. Fulton County not only houses most of the city of Atlanta, it's also home to all potential jurors who will be called to hear the case of State versus Claude Tex McIver. Here's Esther Panich, the defense attorney. Hey, it was very public. It was very gaudy. It was just very unseemly. It just looks bad and smells bad. Tex McIver keeps getting himself into his own trouble, whether it's because his lawyers can't control him or his lawyers just weren't paying enough attention. But these things were occurring, which to anybody looking in would cringe when they would see this. And so I know as a lawyer, I would do my best to practically impale myself (laughs) trying to get to my client to get him to be quiet and to stop bringing unwanted attention on himself, which all it does is make their jobs that much harder. It doesn't help when the defendant himself undermines 
his whole defense. Oh, and he was just getting started. More about that later. There's a lot of ground to cover here in this textbook of how not to behave when you've killed your wife. First, though, there's at least a small bright spot for Tex McIver. Retired FBI polygraph expert Richard Ratcliffe put Tex on the lie detector machine. Ratcliffe, if you'll remember, tested Justin Chapman from the first season of Breakdown. Ratcliffe, who was hired by McIver, asked three questions. Did you intentionally fire the gun that night? Did you consciously do anything with the gun that night that caused it to fire? Did you knowingly cause the gun to discharge inside your SUV? McIver answered no to all three questions. The result? There was more than a 99% degree of certainty that Tex was not being deceptive. As you probably know, law enforcement often relies on the lie detector test as an investigative tool. But the tests are not admissible in court unless both the prosecution and the defense agree to admit them. That happens, of course, approximately never. So by the winter of 2016, the Atlanta Police Department was nearing the end of its investigation of Diane McIver's fatal shooting, and it was looking not terrible for Tex. Hours after the shooting, Danny Jo Carter had told police she was convinced that Tex didn't mean to shoot his wife. This is from Danny Joe's interview with Detective Darren Smith. There is not a doubt in my mind that it was completely one of the most horrible accidents that I okay. know about. He absolutely worships her. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I would get jealous of them sometimes because they were more like lovebirds than right. my husband and I are, and we've only been married. 17 years, right. 16, 16 years. So, and he just, he just was in disbelief. Amid all that apparent consensus, there were still voices of dissent in the community. Joe Beasley, a longtime civil rights activist in Atlanta, told me he saw a lot in the MacGyver story that he didn't like. When I uh, saw that he was not being, you know, locked up, and it, it just disturbed me, and and I know how quick the uh, Atlanta police is to uh, move on on poor powerless people. But it just seemed to me to be uh, very uh, suspicious and mysterious. On December 21st, 2016, the day before Tex McIver's 74th birthday, the Atlanta police charged him with involuntary manslaughter. In this case, it's a felony. He was also charged with reckless conduct. I've been covering courts for 25 years, and I still have trouble with the distinction between voluntary manslaughter and involuntary manslaughter. So I went to our resident legal expert, Don Samuel. He's a criminal defense attorney who has authored several books on Georgia case law. He explains what it takes to be charged with involuntary manslaughter. So there's, you're committing a misdemeanor, and as a result of the misdemeanor, someone dies. Okay, That's involuntary manslaughter felony grade. You can be uh, sentenced to up to 10 years for felony grade involuntary manslaughter. The classic example, which comes up all the time, is you're engaged in reckless conduct. The, the misdemeanor of reckless conduct. Playing with a gun. Allowing a gun to be loaded you know, in a playpen. Any kind of reckless conduct which leads to a death. It's unintentional, okay? Nobody intended anybody to die, but you're engaged in reckless conduct, and that reckless conduct was the what lawyers call proximate cause for the death. Had you not engaged in the reckless conduct, nobody would have died. But you did, and someone died. You have to have committed a misdemeanor, though. But 90% of the time, the underlying misdemeanor is reckless conduct. So, McIver turns himself in and is released two days later on $200,000 bond. He surrenders his passport. Detective Smith's report concludes, and I quote, This case should be considered closed. If there is any additional information obtained in the investigation, it will be forwarded to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, unquote. As we'll see, this case is anything but closed. Christmas 2016. Tex McIver's life and career are in ruin. 
At age 74, he's charged with a felony in his wife's death. He has left his longtime law firm. His name has been besmirched from one coast to another. He's out on bond. And the Fulton County DA is only just getting started. It's becoming clear that the prosecutors think this was an intentional act. And if it was intentional, there had to be a reason, right? Bill, they say people tend to kill for one of two reasons. Money, or sex, or both. Early on in all this, when people were openly questioning whether this was murder, I asked Tex MacGyver whether sex was a motive. Faithful and no affairs. Damn. What's that old expression guys use in bars? Why would you go out for hamburger when you have steak at home? And, and I go, we were together all the time. But the DA's office is chipping at a different approach. Maybe it wasn't sex. Maybe it was money. The DA would obtain search warrants for MacIver's Buckhead condo to seek evidence of a financial motive. DA's investigators also searched the office and home of an estate lawyer who had prepared codicils to Texas and Diane's wills. The affidavits in support of the warrants revealed that the DA wasn't just looking for dry evidence amid old probate files. It was seeking the equivalent of an evidentiary nuclear weapon. It boils down to this. Had Diane MacGyver created a second will? And if there was a second will, a revised will, did it leave Tex out in the cold? According to the affidavit, two of Diane's closest friends told investigators Diane, quote, either contemplated or outright executed a revised last will and testament or codicil, end quote, near the time of her death. The authorities searched the offices and home of estate lawyer Harold Hudson. Here's Hudson at a pretrial hearing. Your basis of your search warrant, I believe, was to come and see. You told me that somebody had told you or some told or Diane had told somebody in 2015 or 2016 that she had prepared a new will. You were looking for a new will that had been prepared in 2015 or 2016 circa, and you were looking for that. And I told you I didn't do it, and I'm still telling you I didn't do it. Investigators also discovered that Diane had given Tex a $350,000 loan to pay for the renovation of the guest house and creation of the Western-style saloon. And in their search of Tex's condo, investigators seized 30 boxes of documents. And they found something else. In the sock drawer of Tex's bedroom chest, they saw a gun. And there were bullets in the drawer above it. It wasn't the gun that killed Diane but it was big trouble for Tex. One condition of his bond, he could not possess a firearm. The DA filed a motion to revoke the bond and put MacGyver back in the pokey. What followed was an extraordinary three-day hearing during which MacGyver's legal team contended that the gun had been planted in his condo. Prosecution wasn't buying that at all. Lead prosecutor Clint Rucker couldn't have been more passionate in his denunciation of MacGyver and the necessity to lock him up. There really is no good explanation about why this man has a gun in his sock drawer. And you have to ask yourself the question, why would he have a gun? After all that we know has happened, why would he have a gun? And I'm going to tell you, Judge, what you can infer from some of the evidence. It's because he is infatuated with guns. He loves guns. The defendant has bad judgment when he has access to guns. Mr. MacGyver is guilty. He is guilty of violating the court's order, knowingly, willingly, and intentionally. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. So I'm asking you to do something about it. I want you to let the defendant know that the rules, they apply to everybody everybody, and that uh, he is not above the law. And then Rucker appears to disclose what's going to happen next. We know that the contention, this is what Mr. Hill just said, it's an accident, terrible accident. The gun that killed uh, Diane MacGyver, it just went off, accidentally, just boom, just, it's a bunch of malarkey. And what we know from the little short testimony you have from the gun expert in here, guns don't just go off, you gotta pull the trigger. Next, on Breakdown, when Tex and Diane fell in love. 
Diane was over there in this elaborate white carriage with these matching horses, white horses, and uh, dressed up with these huge plumes and things like that, and uh, evoke something of the, you would think of the great Gatsby or something of the Art Deco era or something like that, I suppose, and her, her attire, but needless to say, it was quite, quite the affair. You've been listening to Breakdown from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Breakdown was reported and narrated by Bill Rankin and Craig Schneider. Produced by Richard Hallix. Sound design by Chris Basta of Bare Knuckles Creative in Atlanta. Original music for Breakdown was composed and performed by Chris Basta, Bo Emerson, and Billy Guin. Special thanks to Kevin Riley, Bert Roten, Monica Richardson, Chris Joyner, and all the fine folks at the AJC. To the crew at Bare Knuckles Creative... Chris Basta and Chris Nicholson, a.k.a. C1 and C2, and Buddy Hall. And to our good friends Drew Quideris at WSB-TV and Veronica Waters at WSB-Radio. Hello, this is a collect call from... Tex McIver. An inmate at... Fulton County Jail.